Keith Scott is here with me. <laughs> he Hello. is the engineer and designer for Bantu Bikes. And today the goal is to uh, tell the story from Keith Scott's perspective and get some good stories out of him uh, for the, uh, the brand, uh, uncover some of the, the uh, information that's already not documented out there and just kind of uh, allow fans of the brand an opportunity to uh, understand um, where the brand came from and where uh, it is today. So we'll just kind of start there and uh, we'll, we'll go back to a, a summer at, at, at Banshee. So you, mm -hmm. uh, you were doing what? And then you applied to Banshee and then you became an intern. Is well, that's pretty did. much it. So yeah, so uh, yeah, we had a bit of chat before about how to do this. So we were, we're newbies uh, working on it. Uh, <laughs> and apologies for my croaky voice. I'm a bit in the end of a COVID bout. Um, so I may sound a bit like a boring Scottish tennis player, if you know who I mean. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I, my journey with Banshee started years ago. Well, kind of with my journey of really getting into proper mountain biking. I used to think I was a proper mountain biker when I was a teenager in Scotland. Um, and I got into my head that after school, I was going to do a year out before I went to university and live in Canada for a bit and go mountain biking. Um, and so, uh, I worked for a year as an engineer, um, working with Rolls Royce, uh, which was really interesting as an, as a kind of, um, apprenticeship there, uh, Rolls Royce jet engines, not cars. Um, and then at the end of the year, I had a few months before university started and I thought, well, I want to you know, go and live so dirtbag lifestyle, riding bikes and having fun. And the place to ride back then was the North Shore, Vancouver. This was back in 2002. Um, and so I was on the forums, as you did back then. And there's North Shore mountain biking it was kind of my, uh, my way into things. And I, I got contact there for Pippin Osborne, who was the one of the original founders of Banshee and the designer back then. And I just basically wrote to him and said, look, I'm about to start my engineering degree. Uh, and I'm looking to, you know, live in Vancouver for four months. Uh, could I do some work with you guys? Uh, it'd be interesting to me and, you know, also kind of needed a bike to ride. So um, anyway, I uh, wrote to Pip and he's like, we can't do it this year, but maybe next year. And so after my first year of uni, so that summer I spent in Canada having a great time anyway, um, and realizing I didn't really know how to ride bikes by relative standards and learning how to ride a bike. And it was amazing. Um, learned to jump an A-line, scary place. But anyway, um, so the next summer I went and worked for... Uh, Banshee as a sort of summer intern I got paid with a bike for four months of work cheap uh, and uh, I kind of worked I think I worked part-time for them and I rode a lot and it was great uh, and I met the team that back then including Jay Jay was already there um, and a few of the other guys like Pip and uh, Kevin and whatever it was, it was a good little team and they had their own office and warehouse and yeah, it was cool. It was like real small scale um, operation and it was, it was a nice vibe to it. And they were pushing the boundaries back then uh, in the direction of how strong bikes could be, but definitely not how light they could be. And they were pretty um, solid pieces of kit. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just, it was quite cool to be in early, early doors at a fairly new bike company. I think they were what, three years old or something then. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of how it began. I, I spent, let's say, four months helping out a little bit with some design ideas, a bit of computer sort of CAD stuff, um, some finite elements analysis, because I had some experience in that, uh, and just coming up with ideas. But I did a bit of odd jobs in the back as well, building some stuff and helping with the warehousing and basically doing whatever needed done. So yeah, that was my my into the first connection with Banshee. So the summer uh, internship, 2002. 
Something you get like that. Well, maybe it was later than that. Maybe, I think maybe it was 2003, the intern thing. So you 2003 was my first summer in Canada, and then 2003 was when I worked for Banshee. I think that's right. Okay. You got paid with about <coughs> four months of work. Happy as a yeah. clan to do so. Basically, getting into the yeah. industry. Yeah. I wasn't even, to be honest, I wasn't even really seeing it as a way of getting into the industry. It was a way of affording a bike to and ride Canada because I destroyed a real bike. my previous bike. My previous <laughs> bike was in about three pieces. Um, <laughs> I needed a bike for the summer. Uh, and as a poor student, I couldn't really afford anything. So, yeah, getting given a bike was great. I was happy as anything. Um, I lived with a mafia family in Burnaby. Uh, and did um, slightly illegal work at weekends to top up the piggy bank. Uh, but, you know, it was uh, nothing bad. Nobody was hurt with the work I did. I wasn't taking people out or anything. I just <laughs> made a in the school house. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, it was good summers and exactly what you want to be doing. I think I was 19, 20. Yeah, you were 19 like years old. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's a young gun. Um, and uh, 19 and fearless, just yeah. launching off everything and trying to, trying to whip stuff and not always landing it. But you can get away with it. Um, so yeah, and then following on from that, the sort of connection grew with Banshee when I got to my final year. So I, I did every summer in Canada throughout uni. I did two summers working with Banshee. Um, one summer along with a friend Andy who came across with me. Uh, and then my final year, I had to do a thesis for my master's in mechanical engineering. And I contacted Jay, who was the main guy at Banshee really then, um, and basically was like, well, you know, I could do some really boring subject matter. I mean, the number of people that are doing boring things like, I don't want to insult anyone here, but, you know, compacted soil is not really thrilling. Uh, like, uh, or like ram dirt, content, not to get on a tangent or anything like that. But. Yeah, totally, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, like, there were some quite mundane sounding things very important things of course but um yeah the, the projects were pretty boring on the whole and then i also realized i could get extra um extra score for coming up with a unique project working with the industry so i saw that as an opportunity to basically ham it up as if banshee were a big company and this was going to lead on to amazing things um pretend to the university that uh you know this was this was a big deal um got extra bonus points for doing it uh, and I basically made up my own project and said to Jay, look, I'll design a downhill bike. I'll say I'm doing it in your name, you know, in Banshee's name. If anything comes of it, amazing. But I didn't really expect anything to come of it. Uh, I just wanted the points and I wanted to design a bike because that'd be fun. Um, and it's something I'd always had interest in anyway. So, yeah, it's a great opportunity. And Jay was like, yeah, cool, let's do it. Um, so I did my thesis. That was the legend, designing the original legend concept. A bit different from reality, but you know, it, it was the foundation for it. Um, and then, yeah, I basically got to the end of that project. And I was going back to Canada for a year straight after uni anyway to live in Whistler. And uh, Jay's just like, okay, well, yeah, do you want to come work for Banshee? Um, let's work this out. And so I went out thinking, yeah, great. And he's like, yeah, we're going to try and bring this bike to actually become a real product. And obviously, I knew it needed a lot of work. It was real sort of concept stuff. It was more designing for a thesis rather than designing for reality. You know, engineering degrees aren't necessarily very real in some regards in terms of like how things get manufactured and production and marketing and all that um so yeah I needed a lot of work uh and then I came out and lived in Whistler got given a proper old school desktop which was pretty basic but I had the programs on it I needed um and I think the day I arrived there I was basically told okay if you want this job you're now the only designer pips left and I basically walked into if, if I wanted to take this on, I became an owner, designer, but I had no backup, and it was all on me. And that's just kind of the situation with the brand up then. You know, it was 
gone through some tough times and and Jay will talked about maybe the overspending that happened early on when everybody was a bit too excited about things. Um so what uh, what was the year? This was around two thousand seven, something like 2006, that. Two thousand six. Okay. I think. Summer two thousand six. Okay. All right. Yeah. As I think that's as right. As uh, so the the legend's a concept, essentially in your at that point the legend is a concept. In in I mean in, in, in essence I had the pivot in points. your documents. Yeah, it's it's yeah, not I had the pivot points like, in theory yeah. of it. Mm-hmm. I didn't have the structure of it. Um, not really. Uh, I had something that couldn't be manufactured. Uh, nowadays you could three D print it, but mm. it was yeah it was a bit basic. My my thesis was more about the suspension linkage and yep. pivot placement than anything else, and and finite element analysis of sections of it um so it wasn't really about the frame as a whole the front triangle it's kind of just a thing thrown on the front that looked kind of cool um so what, so what did you think when you were provided this ownership opportunity and, and these responsibilities was it yeah. a bit of a, a surprise and so you essentially uh just had two choices you either could just dive into the deep end and and yeah. and do it or you would have to say no there wasn't really an in-between option kind of at that point well i had nothing to lose um yeah. still very young <laughs> yeah i was young i was keen uh and an opportunity was pretty amazing um i honestly back then didn't know where to start when it came to the real world manufacturing i made a lot of mistakes as i think every engineer does and should do throughout their career. And I think if you're not in a position where you're making mistakes, then you're not really being pushed or challenging yourself. <coughs> um, so yeah, I definitely made some mistakes, and um, yeah, it, it was it was a learning process. Uh, the factory were very useful with it. I had old designs to reference, uh, and that was about it um, for things like wall thickness of tubes and stuff. Uh, and also back then we had huge um limits on finances so we couldn't make anything new so the legend actually was not the first bike what we i made the first bike i designed i think was the wild card and then the scythe soon after and so the wild card and scythe actually used the old scream and chaparral forgings um for pivot places and stuff like that they had their own links um but basically i was reusing parts that we already had Uh, and that was one of the limitation factors when designing these bikes it's like we didn't have any money to spend so we i I couldn't design everything from scratch and there was stuff left over the factory so i had to use it so i was making the best of what was there even though it wasn't designed for what i was making um but the wild card was a wicked wee bike you know it was and it was kind of the start of slope style as we know it now and it I kind of introduced that as a slope style bike. So what was it? I think it's like 130 mil travel from memory. I think it was adjustable travel. Um, yeah, 130 or 150 mil travel, I think it was. Um, and it was a great park bike. You know, I had one Whistler Bike Park for testing and we had some cool riders back then, a couple of Aussie guys who were shredders. Um, the bike competed at Crankworks in prototype form, uh, the sort of now joyride. Uh, I think it was just Crankworks slopes all back then. Um, yeah, that was pretty scary. I remember designing <laughs> this bike and then the end of the year, so I was out there the whole year and then you know, we got prototypes and we got these guys on them, the early prototypes, and they were suddenly launching off, you know, 30 foot drops in front of a crowd of 10,000 people on prototype bikes. Yeah, I was a little bit uh, nervous. Felt, we had no problems you, as it happened. You but, felt you know, it, it, responsible it not, for, their, for their result and their Yeah, I mean, we'd done point. destruction testing at the factory oh, and yeah. stuff like that. We, we'd done them in the machine, mechanical loading, but in all honesty, mechanical loading, you can do all the EN tests and stuff like that. It doesn't actually give a very fair representation for mountain biking. It's probably good for road riding, but... For mountain biking, I'd honestly say that it's a, a very easy test to pass. Um, so anyway, we'd done that and we'd kind of done some loading. And I think, I mean, I was on the original prototype. Um, I was the only person riding that one. So I rode it for, I don't know, a summer before anybody else got hold of it. 
Uh, I can't quite remember the time frame of all this, but um, yeah, certainly I, I had it for MDL. So I was putting myself on my own body on the line for MDL. So it was fine. And then these guys were riding a lot harder. And I, I mean, I ridden pretty hard back then, but these guys came along and took it to another level. Um, yeah. they, were, they were riding joyride kind of level stuff. Yeah, they were on, on bikes. bikes. On land, so they were yeah. smashing these bikes. And then the bikes did well, up to it. Well, you know, the, the, the bike design, you know, you touched on it. I, I want to I wanna just know a little bit of what it's like to take a, uh, a, a piece, you know, another bike and design, you know, a, a different bike from what, I mean, you, you worked with what you had, obviously. That's kind of what Yeah, I worked with what I had. And I mean, there's was, there was, there was limits in terms of how the pivot assemblies went together and the spacing of bottom bracket to main pivot for example because that was all one piece um and you know width of pivots and things like that so there were limits in terms of elements but i could change where the pivots were relative to each other apart from the bottom bracket to main pivot um i couldn't do anything particularly clever it all had to fit within the sort of a, a front triangle tube section and rear triangle simple uh, i had to use yeah you know all, all the existing pivot parts and assemblies yokes and things like that were all repeated um the hardware as well so yeah it was it was a bit of a challenge i couldn't do everything i wanted to do and also you know things were starting to move towards bikes being lighter and stuff like that and i was having to work with these what we call them fairly solid forgings um <laughs> i mean even like the head tubes you know, I had to use the head tubes that existed. And I mean, the old scream head tube was 13 mil thick. It was ridiculous. So I, I think I used our cross-country head tube on the slope style bike. And we never had a problem. Everything was just overbuilt, uh, which had been made before. Um, so, yeah, it, it was a bit of a challenge, but there was still quite a bit of flexibility to work around. It was more a case of I couldn't, I couldn't be clever with, linkage designs i had to kind of stick to a simple single pivot with shock actuation uh which is kind of what so. you were most interested in with the uh yeah the let's yeah set. and that's i mean you can achieve scratch in your own back you're that that's kind of what got you into the uh the position you ended up being in was trying to scratch your own back and and uh and explore some of your own interests within bike design and and everything so for for a little while there you just had to do what you could do but it wasn't necessarily what you wanted to do oh, sorry i something's happened on my computer and i can't hear you i can hear Give you me two seconds guys technicalities <laughs> technical difficulties uh i can hear you la 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 <laughs> right are you back can I hear you I can hear you. Can, can you hear me? Oh, no, you're coming out of there. Can you wait a second? Right. <laughs> right. You can hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Right. We're back in the room. Okay, good. Okay. Right. Um, <laughs> what happened there? Uh, I think it popped off and I clicked it. Shouldn't have. Um, sorry. Yes, you were saying... I'm trying to remember where you were. I, I want to kind of go <clears throat> uh, from where you were with the wild card and, and you were manufacturing and, and creating designs from uh forgings that were already pre-created uh so they're relatively simple uh i kind of want to know when the the legend concept uh was was uh created how it was created and and uh when when did that first physical bike actually uh get built and then ridden so the wild card and scythe were basically to keep the company going we needed something to sell they were good bikes, you know, especially the wild card. Its scythe was a little bit maybe behind its times, perhaps. But um, the wild card is a great bike. And we needed those to basically keep the brand going. We needed something to sell, something to keep money going in, and basically finance the legend. Effectively, that's really what they did. I mean, God knows Jay and I weren't really taking a wage back then. Um, <coughs> so, pardon me. Um, so, um, yeah, so while those were, while those had been made and were, were selling, the money was basically being funneled straight into investment in the the legend. Um, so opening forgings. I mean, the legend was a stupidly expensive bike. 
if you were to take, to be honest, this is probably true for most of our bikes. If you were to go to most engineers and most companies, a huge factor of what they do is designing for economy. You know, they'll they'll come out with a design and then work out a way to do it really cheap, and they'll they'll compromise the design in that process. There's no doubt about it. You know, they'll they'll go with uh, cheaper materials or they'll go with cheaper hardware setup or they'll certainly go for sort of cheaper forgings or not forgings at all and things like that. So the legend, you know, originally the legend was designed to be two forgings, one side and the other. We couldn't actually get that made at the time. It was pushing the boundaries of what the bike industry could do uh, in terms of the, the manufacturing supply side of it. The forgings were too big. So we ended up having to split it down. So, you know, the legend originally was going to be two halves, much like the current shock cage in the, the KS2 bikes. Um, it was meant to be split in half down the middle so that all welds were, you know, that there's no loading across welds between pivots. Um, in the end, we went with this, a bottom section, a back section, and two side sections that all welded together. Um, so, you know, it worked, it was fine. But yeah, there was a lot of investment in those forgings. And it wasn't just those forgings, you know, it was the, the dropouts, the links, the yokes. Yeah, it was probably, I don't know, half a million dollars sunk in that. Um, it was also quite uh, a challenge to find suppliers willing to take it on, finding suppliers that could deliver the quality we wanted, the consistency we wanted. Um, so, I mean, the, the sections basically are, are forged, so near net forged, so they they look roughly like the shape, but they don't have the definition of, of features, and then are post-machined to introduce tolerance of bearing pores and cut out, window cutouts and things like that. Um, so, yeah, the, this all costs a lot of money, and we only had a few bikes, models to sell back then to, to make that money, because we didn't really have any money. Um, so the wild garden scythe served that purpose uh, and that then brought the legend along. So legend was kind of the next back and we did a lot of prototyping with the legend. So, you know, I got the original prototype. Um, I'm trying to think, we also had the amp over then. The amp was a, a big seller, which actually is what made everything work for us. Uh, so I remember being in Whistler, the only bike I had, because I had to sell my wild card to pay rent, the only bike I had was my amp prototype. So I was riding Whistler bike park on a hardtail dirt jumper with a hundred mil, no 80 mil forks, which didn't really work. Um, and uh, yeah, I remember hitting, I was hitting a line, I was hitting the clown shoes drop. I was young and dumb. I mean, honestly, my knees are still paying the price. My wrist and ankle still in price, but you know it was fun. I had a great time on it, and it was it was quite a good laugh. Um, and I remember waiting for this legend to be delivered, waiting for this legend to be delivered, and eventually it came. And uh, oh man, it was it was cool. There was all sorts of problems with it. I mean, it was a, a bit of a disastrous prototype. The tolerances were all out, alignment was wrong, it hadn't been put together properly. Um, but once I got those things adjusted for I mean you can adjust for a lot of those tolerances the prototype is. and also you just being prepared to deal with you know a creaky bike or a little bit of play or whatever I managed to get it snugged up pretty well and it, it worked pretty well uh, it was good it was a test bed really to get an idea about shock tunes get an idea about did it behave the way I wanted it to I mean I very much had my head from designing the linkage how this bike was going to feel um, geometry I still had a bit to learn back then so the geometry was a bit off and it wasn't quite what I expected um, but yeah it, it was a really interesting test and then it was really testing for you know see if I could break it um, I say I used to ride fairly hard back then I was riding Whistler Bike Park all day every day it's nothing broke bikes at Whistler Bike Park I think it's probably still true um, and uh, yeah it was it was an interesting summer. It was good. Um, and back then also, you know, there's so much hype around it because I'd done blog posts and various interviews about this bike development before it had come into fruition. So, you know, there's all these images of CAD renderings and whatever floating around. And then suddenly there's this bike here and it's the only one 
being written in existence because the rest were all being you know destruction tested on machines um and yeah it was crazy so quite this, a lot hyper this bike this bike uh i still got it in the panic. cupboard i could bring it out yeah. it still exists <laughs> it's still very strong i can still ride it although it did run on bushings rather than bearings i learned mm -hmm. that um mm -hmm. maybe wasn't ideal uh but and we actually that, had marcelo that... gutierrez on it um, uh -huh. back then when he was 18 he won everything at Cragberg, so he walked away with gold medal in every event he competed in on that bike but the bike needed a lot of maintenance to keep itself running so yeah anyway yeah, i want to hear i want to hear kind of more about like some of the test riders that you did have on it and some of the ride qualities but you were talking about some of the things in your head in terms of finally mm -hmm. getting to uh getting to ride something that you kind of had you know designed from the ground up mm -hmm. utilizing mm -hmm. your own design philosophies what what kind of does you know what, what what is your philosophy and design that led to the legend like what are some of your your principles and beliefs within design and engineering that created that bike oh uh, i guess i mean it's true and it always has been true and always will be true that i design bikes that i want to ride call me selfish um so i i kind of have slightly no compromise probably annoying to people i work with sorry um, I've got quite a no compromise way of designing <laughs> bikes where they probably, I mean, our frames cost a lot to make because I insist on using top materials, top manufacturing, stuff like that. Uh, yeah. Compared to other brands, our frames are two, three times the price to make probably, um, which is maybe not great for business, but I believe that, you know, quality is, uh, you know, it comes out in the right quality of it. And um, so, yeah, basically my, my. My principles for designing a bike are I want to a bike that I want to ride in terms of how I believe it will perform based on the riding discipline. You know, obviously I want a different feel from a downhill bike to a different cross country bike, whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I, I have a certain way, which is not everybody, you know, everybody's got preference, but I, I know how I like my bikes to ride. I like them to work better the harder you ride them. Um, and, and basically be there when you need them so if you're pushing the limits your own limits that the bike is not a limiting factor it's always going to be you that finds a limit before the bikes i mean we've had world cup really top level world cup riders who are like i can't find the limit of this bike um which is always to me kind of the greatest compliment uh so yeah so the print the principle of a bike i want to ride which would be fun that's a big factor um and perform well at the purpose it's designed for and then combine that with i want a bike that looks good you know it's i mean you can look at I, I don't want to mention brands but there are some brands out there that will do bikes that probably perform pretty well engineering principles are sound but they <laughs> the phrase to say they look like they've been designed by an engineer is insulting to engineers to some engineers but there are engineers out there who will do things by the book they'll like take a a book of first principles and design around it and and things will just look pretty awful uh, so for me you know having a, an aesthetic you know i think engineering is a kind of the crossover point between science and art and so um having a bike that looks good and performs well I think it's all important. It's the whole package, isn't it? Um, so yeah. So and then yeah, like you, you mentioned the, the the kind of designing a bike from the ground up for the first time and getting to ride it. I mean, it's the best feeling there is. Uh, it was amazing, especially you know when you're that age and given the opportunity. Um, I mean, I I could build a bike in my garage, which I could ride. But the fact that this was like made by a professional factory. With a whole team of engineers, you know, helping with the, the fabrication of it, and it was going to lead to, you know, I say mass production. It is mass production, just not as mass as some, you know, a reasonable scale of production. Uh, it was really cool, and yeah, it was a really, yeah, no, it was a really rewarding process. Um, and and the fact that I'm making something which brings so much joy to me, and and hopefully everybody that rides our bikes, but. You know, for that first prototype, I was basically making myself a toy. You know, it it, it was really cool. Um, and it sort of that moment where it goes from 
being an image in a computer screen to being you know something you're holding in your hands and writing down a trail was, was pretty amazing um yeah so it's it a cool cool process how long did it take before other people got it into their hands here saying marcelo gutierrez rode one uh so yeah. you got the original one and obviously had to kind of figure out some of the kinks did they get some yeah. quickly thereafter uh or was it a bit of a uh uh, a redesign, refine, and then produce uh, the second batch for testing and further oh, it? it was a long process. So the first one I got, and then there was a batch, I think, of maybe it's five or six. I can't really remember numbers. Um, so the first one I got, but the there was equivalents also, which went to lab testing. And then once we ironed out, it was really down to tolerances and alignment of things once we got those things sorted out we did a, another run of like let's say five or six which went to riders we had marcelo as one um writing that so that was like the first well pre-production run i guess you call it pro second prototype run um marcelo and oh, another brazilian guy whose name is escaping me right now but he was like brazilian national champion at the time oh um, I can't remember. Marco Burkhold? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, and so it was really cool. That was really amazing for me to see. You know, Marco had all the experience. Marcelo had all the speed. Um, those two guys, you know, really putting it through his paces and getting feedback. And from Marcelo's dad. I mean, Fernando was, was very useful. He was hilarious, a uh, real character. Um, but you know, he had a his good engineering mind and he had his lathe out all the time. And he was always making parts and trying things out and trying different bushings because everything ran on bushings then, as I said. And uh, tolerances might have been a problem. Axles got worn, bushings got worn. So they needed a lot of work. So the first batch were on, bush on bushings, got ridden a lot. I mean, Marcelo won everything. It crank works on it regardless. Uh, Markov was competing internationally on it. Um, yeah, they, they got well used. Um, we didn't have any structural problems, but we definitely had problems with the bearings, uh, not the bearings, the, the bushings, the, the pivots, wear, and stuff like that. Um, some tweaks were made to geometry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we did a batch of fifty pre-production frames. Um, now, as I had mentioned earlier, we'd done a lot of blogging about this stuff, like video blogs, um, about the development of this bike. And there's a lot of people that followed it quite rigorously. Uh, and we're really interested in loads of comments. Forums were chattering away about this. Um, so I came up with the idea of, well, look, let's do some real world testing on this. Let's get some good feedback. But also, I mean, there's an element where there's a promotional aspect to it um, and financial aspect to it that we ended up making 50 pre production bikes with bearings um, and a number of improvements. Um, to be tested in the real world, because we, we recognize pretty quickly that the real world is a lot harsher than machine testing. Um, and also everybody tests in different ways, you can ride in dry conditions or wet conditions. You can have somebody who likes to land everything to flat. You can get the people to land every jump sideways. You know, we've seen all. Um, but yeah, we did 50 bikes. We had 50 pre-production testers around the world that bought the bikes at cost. So we covered our costs on them. So this was a, a huge thing for us. We didn't make any money. We probably lost a bit of money, to be honest, with shipping and various other factors. And there are some broken ones that had to be replaced. But um, yeah, we had 50 testers around the world providing feedback, you know, sending out feedback to them, like search forms to fill in. They were giving me good feedback by emails. They were all mechanics, racers, mechanically minded people, uh, free riders. You know, there was a whole spectrum of proper good riders who you know to qualify you had to be able to provide sort of engineering feedback as it were um do i, do I also remember correctly that uh, mick Hanna for a short time was on one mick Hanna was, was getting, on one yet was he he was no. he was getting back into world cup racing after he initially yeah. uh, uh i think he might have been on marcelo grade ones i think he was on like the pre-production ones with marcelo 
I yeah, remember when he was getting back into right. downhill racing after his initial retirement. Uh, this is just kind of like for me, just one of those memories of first memories of yeah. Angie for me is, yeah. is uh, Mick Hanna was was getting back into the sport and he was like seeing an angel fire riding one or something like that. So um, that that was kind of he, he rode one before he picked up other sponsorship. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, he was floating around. He was kind of thinking of getting back into the bike industry. Uh, we had a connection to him somehow. I can't remember if he reached out to us or. Anyway, we, yeah, we got in touch with them one way, and, and yeah, he was testing. I can't remember what stage he was testing. I think it was one of the prototype ones he was testing, like really early doors. Uh, maybe the same time as Marcelo was on it. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was a, from his perspective, I think it was quite interesting. From our perspective, it was great to have somebody of that caliber riding the bike um, and his insight. Um, yeah, I'd almost forgotten that he'd ridden my bikes. Right? Um, <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of riders like that that kind of come through Banshee. It's cool. Uh, and um, yeah, so yeah, it was interesting having that. So yeah, anyway, these these um, these fifty pre-production ones uh, were testing the field for about a year. So this was, I mean, we were probably now three years into this since the first prototype started getting made. Um, before actual production frames started getting made. So yeah, we had a year of these pre-production ones. We got all the feedback. We had some issues. There was a, we had a rear triangle strut. It was a tubular uh, section instead of a bar, like a solid bar, which we used afterwards. And they, they broke at the well vent holes. So, you know, there's was, was a few things that we learned in that, that process. There's a couple of Aussie riders. Um, yeah, it was, you know, uh, Vorsprung, Steve of Vorsprung was one of our testers back in the day before he was Vorsprung. Uh, you know, we, we had some really knowledgeable guys riding our bikes, giving great feedback. Um, and also, I mean, we used it all to make the, the production frames way better, and they were way better. Um, and all those guys who got pre-production one also got a, a production one at cost. And that was kind of part of the deal. Once it was refined, they, they had the option of buying another a production one at our cost. So they ended up probably paying about the same as they would for a new bike, but they got the whole, they got two frames. Um, and yeah, that's kind of cool. So a few of those frames are still floating around out there. I see them every once in a while. Um, and yeah, so yeah, we had a lot of really good insight from a lot of testers uh, to develop that bike uh, and finally got to production. And, and you know, the rest is history as it were. Um, it's been modified and changed several times since it was released but um you know geometry tweaks and things like that different wheel size so the original one was 26 inch that's how long ago it was um but i mean the basic principle of the frame hasn't really changed um and it doesn't you know it doesn't need to change because it, it works well so yeah yeah it's, it's quite a journey the legend uh, in which case in. that kind of brings us into the evolution of the uh the 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 v1 through v3 the uh the, yes. the creation of other bikes like the spitfire which caught on for me at least uh, when i saw that in bike magazine uh, the downhillers bike if you will which was yeah, great was and bike. also terrifying probably uh mm. for you and in, in the brand because then people started probably just uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so downhillers down trail bike yeah, that was a, a phrase that I came up with. It's been used by many brands since, but I originated it. And it was a bit of an error because so many people took it as a, a downhiller, no, like a downhill bike that could ride trails. And so we had people hitting road gaps and racing downhill on them. And this was, 100 and, was 125 mil travel, uh, quite lightweight bike. The random bushings, the V1s. Um, so this was developed kind of with what we learned from the pre uh, from the prototype legends so we we got the bushings sorted sort of they, yeah we had some consistency of manufacturing issues but in essence when they manufactured it to to, to tolerances and as per the design it worked really well there's still some of them out there running fine but yeah the bushings are not um user friendly uh so anyway yeah that was yeah, I'm trying to think, what did we have? We had the, the Spitfire and Rune. I think we had any others back then. So yeah, it's just those two models. So the, the Spitfire was kind of the, the downhill trail bike and the Rune was, well, it was the all mountain bike, but I guess by today's standard being an enduro bike. Um, and 
yeah, so they came out, well, when did they come out? 2008, eight nine. So they came out when The Legend, I think, was still really in development. They kind of overlapped a lot. I can't quite remember the time frame on the scale of all. But uh, yeah, those were good bikes. They were fun. Um, if, you, if you got a good one. Unfortunately, that was the issue we had with those is depended if the guy who was manufacturer or, or controlling the tolerances in that day was doing what it should have and if the quality control person inspected things. And that, that leads actually in big part to why Jay moved to Taiwan is because we realized if we weren't there for every frame being produced, standards slipped. And so Jay moved from Canada to Taiwan to to be at the factory on a daily basis. Um, and thankfully, Jay loves Taiwan. So, um, yeah, it worked out quite well. Uh, but yeah, yes, yeah, so that was the v, V1s. And then the V2s, the design changed a fair bit. So... Yeah, we, we got rid of the bushing, went to bearings, so it's obvious change. But also the, the design linkage. changed. Yeah, the design kind of changed. It had to change a little bit. Yeah, no doubt there were yeah. some, some, uh, some issues that had to be refined with the V1. But the V1 being a good bike, uh, yeah. good design. The V1 then, was good when you got a good one and it was working. Yeah, um, which prompted the, v, the V2s to be the V2. Created. Yeah, this, the V2 was basically based to have a sort of similar ride characteristic, but I developed it so that it, the shock was driven by the rear triangle, which extended into the front triangle. Um, the main reason for that was to reduce the rotation of the shock eyelet to make it so it was more, uh, you know, combining that with bearings. I basically was trying to make the system as low friction as possible, so it was as supple as possible. <coughs> that was really the main. Um, thought process behind that and also I thought it looked pretty cool um and yeah it also made things slightly lighter for the strength as well you know there's a number of factors that came into play there um so yeah the, the v2s came along um I'm trying to remember yeah I can't remember if that was the first one I called the KS link well somebody else coined the term that stuck I got a bit embarrassed by that it was a total tongue-in-cheek go at a certain <laughs> other engineer in the bike industry uh yeah anyway um and uh yeah and so the the v2s came out and it expanded a little bit the prime came along and the phantom um so the 29er market started to take off and we started to dabble we're a bit late to the party but that's our style we we, we don't like to jump in with every fad we like to see what sticks and then do it better um that's kind of our approach to how we try and design our bikes um i remember the prime was the first 29er to be backflipped on camera uh with when we had mike montgomery the slope style rider uh he made it look very easy so no big deal um and uh yeah so so those bikes the v2 did pretty well they were they were good bikes they were fun um they yeah they were they were they're just generally good bikes, I felt. Um, they still have some issues, but um, I think every bike, I'm trying to, every bike has issues. It's just they take longer to find. You know, the issues become less and less apparent and they take longer to sort of appear. Uh, and each time you refine and develop a new design, or from my perspective, each time I refine and develop a new design, I'm taking the best of what I've done in the past, uh, refining it, making it better. And you know, adding in new concepts along the way to basically try and um, ensure that any issue we ever have had in the past is resolved, any performance factors are improved. Um, what, so yeah, what, kind the, the issues, really good. what kind of issues? Uh, well, well, I think I mean, the, the V2 that kind of prompted the, uh, the V3, the refinement that ended up kind of with the V3 and into and today's current models. Uh, any, any bike that has got a shock sitting on the down tube, which is driven by the rear triangle, sort of, you know, horizontally, has issues to tackle. Um, there's a loading factor. There's a lot of load from the shock, and the down tube has to take that. I don't have to mention any brands. People will straight away be recognizing that there are brands out there that are failing left, right, and center who still do this. Um, there's also, because we make things from alloy, 
one of the big factors that became apparent for those was the controlling the frame through welding and controlling in terms of you know when when the welds cool they pull the frame around the frame can contort slightly and the the shock mount liked to bend the down tube not enough that you could see it but enough that it would impact the shock placement just enough so that you know tolerances of other sections of the frame once the whole linkage was assembled might become a, a bit harder uh, geometry sometimes varied a little bit um and then also you know it's the uh angular alignment was also difficult to control because you're basically taking the rear triangle as a straight line attaching to the shock as a straight line attaching to the front triangle but there are different parts and sure any angular alignment you have you know if you're half a degree out that was obvious because it's extended along this line um so alignment i mean our alignment was pretty good generally compared to most brands and always has been but um it wasn't good enough in my mind uh we had too many you know too many cases where it just moved a little bit one way or another um and it did vary depending on who was welding the bikes or what time of year it was you know we we had more problems with bikes that are welded in the heat of summer than we did in the, the depth of winter i mean taiwanese winters probably average temperature is like 10 degrees centigrade and summer is like 35 um so yeah, I mean, it was there was quite a few variables there, and so moving to the KS2 bikes with the shock cage where the the linkage, you know, all the front triangle pivots, well, the two front triangle pivots are on in the the shock cage as well as the shock mount. Um, it it contains them all. It, it ensures alignment. It gets rid of any welds between, you know, points of load. Um, it removes the a lot of the angular like the angular amplification i guess because the shocks that are you know vertical um and one of the big factors was it like a bottle cage um so yeah i mean there, there were so many factors really uh that, that came into play things like people wanted internal cable routing dropper posts were becoming a big thing um i also wanted to I did it for the V2s, I came out with modular dropouts. Now, the modular dropouts was really, my initial plan with that was to be able to adjust geometry for preference. But it quickly became apparent that it was very useful because 148, boost 148 got introduced. I'm like, oh, we can just offer that. Great, we don't have to change anything. You can offer that alongside 135 and 142. We had all three options. And then, oh, 27.5's become a thing. 29's become a thing. Oh, we can offer that. Um, you know, we just do a different dropout for them. So the modular dropouts was was a great feature in terms of you could set the bike up as you wanted for geometry, but also you could set up to whatever wheel standard. If if you had a really nice wheel set, you could buy the frame to go to that. You you wreck your wheel set and you want to go to the latest stand, standard, uh, then you know you could just buy a new wheel set and get a new set of dropouts. And your your frame's still good rather than having to throw the whole frame away um, or being locked into a wheel standard. So, yeah, that was cool. And then, you know, now people run, you know, long dropouts and 29ers because they like the really long chain stays or, you know, you can you can do all sorts. You know, people ran short dropouts and still managed to squeeze 27.5 rear wheel in there or even mini mullet. It. You, there are so many options you could do with our bikes. And that was one thing I wanted to enable as best I could was the ability to um for the customer to to customize it to what they needed to to match standards to match geometry i didn't want to lock them into some pre-conceived this is what you should ride because it's the best because there's no such thing as the best there's no such thing as the best geometry there's no such thing as the best suspension kinematic there's no such thing as the the best anything because everybody's got a different riding style everyone rides in different places everyone's got different ability it's what's best for you is what matters and so having a certain level of adjustment enables that you could argue that being infinitely adjustable might be really good for that but actually infinite adjustability requires the the rider to really know what they want and be able to make that happen it's a little bit like 
shocks that have got huge rates of adjustability. You know, I, I deal with a lot of customers who have questions about shock setup. And when they were Cane Creek shocks, for example, and we used to spec them, you know, good shocks if set up right. But if they're set up badly, they can be the worst shocks in the world because they don't work for you. And you got the people that would like turn the knobs and have it all over the place. They wouldn't follow the trail the like, setup guide or, or bass tunes. And they're like, why is my shock not working? It's like, well, you've not set up properly. And you could extrapolate that to geometry. You could extrapolate that to, you know, linkage kinematics, whatever. Um, so there's an element I like to give a range that will work for the vast majority of customers to, to get a performance that will work really nicely for them. But I don't want to make it difficult for them, if that makes sense. Yeah, and you mentioned alloy versus carbon, and you've got some yeah. thoughts on other. Uh, I've got stances on this. I mean, on, on other yeah. things as well, uh, current trends in the uh, the industry as well, some of the new parts and component componentry coming out. Uh, I don't know yeah. if you want to touch on. I know uh, that uh, let's, we've documented let's alloy, tail. but uh, I mean, uh, yeah, P people who who maybe know me from years of blogs or you know, interviews I've done or whatever, know that I fairly strong, have fairly strong opinions in a bunch of things. Um, they are just opinions. They're not facts, they're opinions. But, um, <clears throat> you know, let's look at alloy versus steel or carbon or whatever. Um, if weight weren't a factor, and probably steel would be a great thing. If money weren't a factor, probably titanium would be the best thing. Um, but weight and money are both factors. Alloy is great. Carbon, I mean, I always go to this old thing, uh, like road bikes, yeah, make them out of carbon because aerodynamics are important and the loading is predictable. Um, if you take a Formula One car as an example, like a road bike, you know, they, they know the loads, the road is smooth, everything is pretty predictable except for crashes, but you know, you can build a cage around that. Um, you, carbon's great for that because you can shape it as you want. Uh, it can be light, but only if you know how it's going to be loaded and the load's predictable. Otherwise, it can end up being quite a lot heavier than aluminium. There's carbon frames out there a lot heavier than our bikes. Um, you know, carbon is only strong generally in the the way it was designed to be strong. You know, it's it's not like um, you know, metal is isotropic, so it's, it's equal strength in all dimensions. Um, and carbon is not. Carbon is only really strong in tension. Now you can you can weave it in certain ways and, and layer it in certain ways, so it's strong in compression. But ultimately, the carbon material itself is only strong in tension. Um, so, and then there's the fact that you can damage it without being able to see the damage, stuff like that. So yeah, I come back to the analogy of. Formula One car versus a rally car. Now a rally car, you know, they're going over rocks, they're having things hitting them, they, they're crashing, and getting back on the track and kind of finish the thing. You know, they're generally, you know, the the structural parts which are important to keep moving are made of aluminium. Um, there are exceptions to that, but as a general rule, you know, the suspension struts, for example, or um, steering columns, you know, things like that are, are made of, of alloy or sometimes steel, um, because, you know, a rock jumping up, yeah, it might dent it, but you can carry on driving. Whereas it's carbon, you, it might just explode. Um, and also when they get to the end of a stage and, and, you know, there's an inspection, they can see where the damage is. Carbon, it might be just as badly damaged, but you can't see it necessarily. Now, I know that carbon can be repaired and, and things like that. I, I get that. But ultimately, for me, I feel I can make a better product an alloy that is near as makes no difference as light as carbon for the same strength. Um, I also personally prefer the ride characteristics of alloy. Carbon frames, you know, a lot of carbon manufacturing now ends up with the way they use the molds, it ends up with quite big tubes and quite thin walls. So it ends up being a very stiff thing i mean the, the most obvious way to talk about this is carbon handlebars you know somebody somewhere decided let's do 35 mil carbon bars because stiffer is better uh and those with sore wrists and elbows after riding them for a while 
will totally tell you, wait a minute, why did we make this change? Because 31.8 was perfectly good. And I mean, personally, on all my bikes now, I run 31.8 alloy bars because they feel so much better. Um, you know, it's uh, you, you can be clever with how you do the carbon. There's different types of carbon that might have more flexibility and stuff like that. Um, but generally speaking, for frames, I think the stiffness profile of an alloy bike results in a a better feel on the trail. Uh, that's a difficult thing to define, but for me, I feel like the I don't know, there's a bit more life in it. If that makes sense. I find often that carbon frames can feel quite dead, quite wooden, stiff, tiring to ride. Um, maybe not to pedal, but like if you're, let's face it, what we're interested in is the descending. Um, you know, it's, yeah. Uh, so I, that's my thoughts on alloy versus carbon. I've got opinions on everything, by the way. But um, I also recognize that my opinions are not facts and everybody is different on these things. And so I'm not forcing that opinion on you, but that is my belief. Uh, based on my experience of riding lots of bikes and lots of components. Um, so yeah. And in terms of, yeah, you mentioned um, standards. Yeah, the bike industry doesn't really have standards. Uh, it annoys me when I say like, this new standard. If it's a new standard, it's not standard. Um, unless everybody adopts it and everything else is dropped. And it's universally compatible. So yes, there are new standards. I mean, the, the latest one that is this UDH and you know T-type transmission mounting. Well, it's not a standard because you know Shibano and TRP don't utilize it, and you can utilize UDH. Yeah, okay, fine, that's good. But UDH, I mean, I know that our hangers are stiffer and stronger and lighter, and cost generally about the same if not less so a customer can just take a hanger with them on holiday and I, I understand the benefit of having udh you can buy any shop in theory if they have them um that, i like that concept but you know we supply a spare hanger with the frame from the get-go our hangers don't break all that often you know i know people that have ridden our bikes for years and never broken a hanger um so I don't think it's necessary. It might be something I move towards, but I might try to do it better. Um, and in terms of T-type transmission, I, I've not ridden one. I shouldn't comment too much, but um, I just in the price and weight and performance gains, pedaling under power, I mean, uh, changing gear under power, sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've never had a problem changing gear, has to be said. Yeah, okay, maybe it's a nice thing. I'd have to ride it to see. But I still think somebody should just come out with a good internally geared hub. It's got like nine gears, not overbuilt beyond belief. It will weigh less, I think. I've got kind of an idea, a design in my head. And I guarantee I could, I can't guarantee, but I would, I would say I could build it to be less than a current hub plus new cassette plus new derailleur. I mean, that's like... I don't know, 1.2 kilograms or something now for that setup. Um, and the price is bonkers. Uh, but you're talking to a guy who still likes his mechanical gears, mechanical dropper. Um, hell, I'd probably have mechanical brakes if they're any good. Uh, yeah, I I like to be able to work on my own bike. I like... I like the feel of mechanical things. I get, I, I get a sense of feedback when I change gears. Uh, you know, and you can you can feel when you're changing gears. So it's clicking when there's a problem. They're not the detachment. I've ridden a bunch of um, different wireless gearing setups, and I was just kind of felt as detached from the process. I, I guess it is a little bit like driving a manual car versus driving an automatic. There's nothing wrong with the automatic. But if you really are driving for the experience of driving, the, for the joy of driving, a manual is always going to be better. Um, and so I, I quite like that manual thing. And that kind of, I guess, the Banshee ethos in a way is kind of similar to that is we don't go for the hype. We, we go for what we feel brings the most joy, fun, confidence in our bikes. So yeah, for me, that's what it's all about anyway. I think uh, 
that's a good place to uh, stop just over an hour in, uh, unless you got oh, any other comments yeah. on anything else, any other juicy tidbits to, to leave anyone uh, with, uh, any other take me off any direction, the top get... of your mind uh, in the industry? I'm not going to go to e-bikes, but no, we're not making one. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't believe in polluting the environment for no good reason. Uh, yeah, I, I could go off on so many different tangents, as Brian will attest to over the years. Um, this was kind of more of a uh, look back on the history, kind of where yeah. where you came into the uh, to the Banshee story and kind of how it was built, if you will. So uh, I think if maybe this ever can... makes it to a, a YouTube thing, God forbid, uh, <laughs> then you can wait. What do you gonna say? Like and subscribe. Um, probably should have done that at the start. Right there. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, yeah, put in comments anything you want to. You know, any questions you want me to discuss, any opinions, any stuff like that. I'm I controversial suppose, sometimes. So, I suppose um, that that's worth bringing up. You're very involved in the uh, the forums, the local community pages, Facebook, other other yeah. aspects. Uh, and that's that's a huge part of the brand, too, is the fact that, uh, yeah, you're hands on. You're uh, you're able to communicate with the uh, the fans out there in the community. And that's, if, that's, if you don't. If you don't communicate with your own customers, how do you know what the customers want? Um, and there are lots of brands out there who will push their own agenda and they will rely heavily on expensive marketing to basically convince people that what they want is what, you know, what the brand says is good is what customers want. I'm kind of almost the opposite. I try to listen to what customers want and deliver it. Um, and not spend anything on marketing because you know we're a small brand we don't have big budgets um you know we we probably run on more of a shoestring than just about any brand in the world apart from like you know carriage operation ones so um yeah it's it's quite a an important thing for us um that we we listen to customers i learn as well i take on board feedback use it to improve things be it designs be it customer relations, service, availability product in different places, whatever, you know, and we, you know, there's not many of us at Banshee, we all do a bit of everything. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really important to listen to, to customers and to gauge general consensus of what people want. Because if you don't do that, then why are we doing this? Really? I think that's good. Yeah. Like, subscribe, and uh, like subscribe. leave your comment. I got to go uh, turn Should off Should we get a Patreon? Video. Let's get a Patreon. Maybe we can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to give us lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, 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 that was Keith Scott right there, uh, engineer, designer, owner of Banshee Bikes. Again, I'm Brian Peel, uh, media yeah. manager, as well as many other things for Banshee Bikes. And I have, right. a, I have a robot on the loose here. Let me... Oh, there we go. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, <laughs> uh, the You're lucky that neither myself or Brian have been invaded my by maid. children. My maid. This just is, this yeah. Is... yeah. I, I'm surprised we made it over an hour without being invaded by children. I didn't anticipate yeah. getting invaded by uh, my uh, robot. Zero just knocked in the window over there at one point. I'm like, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, well, that's fine. We're, we're family time. friendly, uh, friend. But um, yeah. Time to go, I anyway. guess, huh? This is cool. an experimental thing, by the way, guys. We are. Yep. Uh, if this does ever make it live, we are just mucking around with this. Well, that's my job. And seeing that people react to engage with it. Um, hopefully, you'll find it insightful and useful, um, and of interest. Just let us know. All right. Signing off. Cool. Signing off. Cheers, Brian. Have a Cheers. good one. Bye, everybody. Who's